I don't know how many times uh, I've heard over the years, every hunter has heard over the years that um, culling can be really effective. You hear it all the time in magazine articles you read, you, you hear it all the time on uh, TV shows that I'm harvesting a particular buck to get it out of the, out of the, the gene pool. You're taking deer that you think are calls or management deer, whatever you want to call them, um, and you have this preconceived notion that this deer is never going to be good and I need to get him out. You may be right. You may be absolutely right. Uh, but you, if you're wrong and he's just having a bad year or the environment he hasn't caught up yet, he hadn't been able to fully express those genetics, um, you've probably shot a deer that you would have been really, really happy with two years from now. You know, so all of these non-genetic factors have a much bigger impact on antler development than some of the genetic factors do. We can see that with, you know, with a lot of research where just providing nutrition makes a bigger impact in a generation than any kind of selection can. that particular buck that you shot, um, that genetics is controlling that. And that if I were to remove that, quote, genetically inferior buck, that I'm getting it out of the gene pool and that I'm only gonna leave, you know, above average or larger antlered bucks to be sires or to be fathers. And that if you do this uh, over time at, at enough intensity, as a result, you are gonna get offspring or you're gonna get buck fawns and yearlings and so forth that are gonna grow up to be above average. And so often people think that culling is gonna be a way that over time, they're going to improve the average antler size of the deer herd. I think it's something that's really embedded in our hunting culture is that I need to remove a deer or a group of deer because if I take them out of the gene pool, if I take them out of the herd, that it's going to improve antler size. What made this unique and so different in such a landmark study is that this was done in a free-ranging environment over a large acreage, 25,000 acres, and it was done over, you know, 10 to 12 years. We've got a weigh scale out there, we've got people that are assigned to scoring deer, people assigned to collecting data, people assigned to hair samples, antler samples, and then just it takes quite a few people just to hold deer down and, and, and make sure that the deer's going to be safe and the people working on the deer are going to be safe as well. The intensity that it was done experimentally was an intensity that's probably could never be done with hunters. And so using the techniques that you've seen over a decade now, to be able to use a helicopter, to be able to live capture these bucks, to be able to actually measure the antler size that the researchers used, and you're being able to age the deer. So there's no hunter guessing is that a yearling buck, a two-year-old buck, a three-year-old buck, the buck has been captured. A biologist is aging the buck and then using the criteria whether it is going to be kept or whether it's going to be called. So it's, it's absolutely the best case scenario for a large acreage over a long period of time. And if it didn't work at this scale and at this intensity, I don't think you could ever expect it to work uh, using culling by hunters. I think that people put way more focus on genetics for antler development than, than it deserves. And we can estimate the proportion of all the antler development for, for the population that's due to inherited genetic factors. And for young bucks, it's maybe 25% of all the, the differences among individuals is due to genetics. For mature bucks, it's probably 40 to 45%. Now that leaves another 50 plus percent that's due to what we call environment, part of which is nutrition. What hunters shouldn't do is make harvest decisions thinking that they are gonna cull a buck or a group of bucks 
and, and think that they are going to improve the genetics of the herd. In some ways, people seem to, you know, their first reaction is, you know, we're trying to cull and do all this genetic manipulation and it, it, you're telling us now that it doesn't work, what do we do? Well, I think it's good news because that other 50 plus percent that's due to environment is something that managers can directly affect. And so by nutrition, that means improving forages, planting food plots, all of those type of things are definitely within management control. And they can happen within a pretty short period of time, within a couple of years. You know, several years of a good food plot or other nutrition program can make a huge difference in, in body weights and antler size and things like that. And you could never make that fast of a leap just by manipulating genetics alone. You can use these same tools to say, what's the potential of these bucks to sire offspring that have better antler development? And so the estimation of that is called a breeding value. So in other words, no matter what that buck looks like, he might have small antlers, but we might be able to predict based upon his genetic potential that his offspring might be above average, or maybe they're below average. It could be a large antler buck that has very large antlers, but whatever it is about that doesn't translate into the offspring. So again, I redirect into those things that those enhanced nutrition. And for some, it's going to be supplemental feed, food plots, and planting the right trees for the right mass crops, and, and burning, and forest management, all of those things. That's where you need to concentrate your efforts. So after 13 years of capturing deer, some of the smartest people in whitetail research analyzing data from Mississippi State to and in Kingsville and beyond. I guess the end, end result is that culling doesn't work in wild populations. At the end of the day, it doesn't work.